live from Discovery Headquarters in Silver Spring, Maryland. It's the October Seasonal Sign Stream featuring Simple Machines. This is our seasonal sign stream, part of a monthly broadcast where we focus in on using digital media around hands-on activities. This, week's, uh, this month's topic is going to be dealing with simple machines. And simple machines is part of our everyday life. We see them everywhere we are. And even in this simple little game that we've got here, we've got a lot of simple machines. So to get us started off right, wonderful, all right. So we're going to be talking about a lot of different things around simple machines. Hey, for example, how do simple machines affect work? What are some examples of simple machines? How do they change the, um, the direction of motion and of force? So in your classroom, Real quickly, while you're sitting there with your teachers, ask a simple question. What is a simple machine? So, she, and see if you can share some examples with that. So they're gonna, they're gonna help me out with our simple machines, and we're gonna start with the lever, right ladies? All right, so let's take a look at what we've got. Let's look at a simple lever system. We're gonna set this one aside for just a minute. And being science teachers, we'll, we'll help you out. We'll get through this in just a second. We've got our lever right here, right? Now, can you help me out with the parts of a lever? Do you think? Okay. All right. What is this section right here part of a lever called? Fulcrum. The fulcrum. All right. So think, talk in your class out loud and discuss how does a fulcrum affect, and the location of a fulcrum affect the use and the force required of a lever. We're going to take a look at a little lab activity. So if you'll come, come on over with me, Betsy and Jen. And actually, come on this side if you would, right over here. Thank you. And the first thing we're going to do is we want to see, we've got a set of weights here. And I want you to let me know, measure off how heavy or how much energy in joules is required to lift up that series of weights. So if you would help me out, Betsy. And let me know what we find out. Lifting straight off the table, how many joules we take in there? We're requiring four. Uh, newtons. I'm sorry. Newton, four, <laughs> I said joules, and it's newtons. My bad. Four, what is newtons. It? four newtons. Thank you. All right. So let's see if our force is changed by using the lever. So let's see how many newtons it requires now using our lever to lift our mass. How many newtons it's required to lift the object? So if you'll hook that onto our lever. And right now, let's put our fulcrum right in the center for right now. About the center there. Can you get it on there? That's right. If you can just pull it straight down, it'll be all right. Okay. And how many newtons are we required? Good. Still right at four. Right at four. All righty. So how do you think we could change how much force is required? What could we adjust? Can we move the fulcrum one way or the other? Okay. Which way do you want to try to move it? Let's slide it. Um, Closer to the waist. Let, let it quite closer to the mass, okay? Let's try to move our fulcrum. Our fulcrum is the center point, the pivot section of our lever. And let's see if that affects how many newtons is required to lift our object. Right at two. Right at two. And before we were at what? How many newtons? Four. Four newtons. So by adjusting the fulcrum, we've lessened the, the newton force required to lift our object, correct? So let's do another little activity with that. So in this case, we've got a different type of lever, and our lever's made out of PVC pipe, and we've got a different weight. Our weight's gonna be our pumpkin, because we're focusing in on pumpkin patch science this week, this month. So first off, I'm gonna have one of you hold this, but before we do that, where is my fulcrum at this point in time? Where's the fulcrum? Yes. In the center? In the center, right here at the beginning. All right, so who would like to hold this? Okay. Betsy will hold that for me. So. Depending, we talked about the further our fulcrum was away from our mass, what happened to the amount of newtons required? It was the further away, it was less. Further away our fulcrum was from our mass. We, need, we needed more. We needed more the further away we got, right? The closer we got to the, to the mass, the less it needed. So let's see if that still applies with this lever. So we're going to put our mass onto our, our fulcrum at the center here. We're going to put our mass on our hook closest to the fulcrum. And see if you can lift that up. Not too bad? All right. A little heavy, but not, not too bad. bad. Not too bad. All right. Let's try what happens if we move it further out. So for time's sake, we're going to move it way out. <laughs> Hang on, OK? Uh, maybe. We'll do it against it. You 
can hold it against you all you'd like. Okay. You ready? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> so what you notice about the amount of force required to lift that one keep holding that. What's the, what about the amount of force required to lift it? You need a lot more force to lift it. Okay, and where was our mass in relation to our fulcrum? It was further in. Further right out. So what have we learned about fulcrum with relation to our mass? It needs to be closer to the mass. To reduce our force needed to lift it. Beautiful. Alrighty. So in your classroom, when we shifted that fulcrum it reduced the amount of newtons required to lift that mass. So if you want to explore that, we've got a great activity within our website. It's called Levers, Ups, and Downs. So we're going to take a look at that real quickly for you. And while we do that, we'll shift over to our next table. So I hope you enjoyed that. That's a great resource. Again, it's the Levers, Ups and Downs. You can find that in the Discovery Education Science Textbook. It's one of our resources that's available for you to, to explore Levers with. So we've got more assistants helping us out. So again, introduce yourself for us, where you, who you are and where you're from. Corinne Adamowitz at Burris Laboratory School, part of Ball State University. And? Diana Grauman, and I am from St. Bartholomew in Columbus, Indiana. Great. So our next simple machine is we're going to work with is the inclined plane. So we're going to adjust this just a little bit for the camera here. And we're going to see how an inclined plane affects the amount of energy or force required to lift an object. So let's start off with, we've got our weights again, and that is our mass, and we've got our scale that we're going to measure how much force or energy is required in newtons to lift that up. So if you will help me out, Diane, let me know how many newtons is required to lift that object. Looks like four. About four, great. So let's see what happens now. If we take our inclined plane, and we allow Corinne to pull the same mass up our inclined plane. Let me know how many newtons. We'll shift that. Just, just flip it the other way for a second. There you go. Let me know how many newtons it's requiring you to pull that up. About two newtons. So what, how much have we cut our inner, uh, force required in? How much have we cut it? We cut it about half. About half by using the inclined plane within our activity. So can you think of some places, out, and this is for the folks out there watching, where you may have seen an inclined plane being utilized to reduce the amount of force required. Can you go ahead? You by using an inclined plane. So again, a discussion question for your classroom. plane is a flat surface, not the nickname for an airplane. A tabletop, the floor. Welcome back. So we're back again, still looking at our simple machines. So in this case, we're working with um, the concept of a wedge. And hopefully you enjoyed that last little segment on the, the inclined plane. There's lots of resources out there in Discovery Education Science textbook built around the inclined plane that you can explore. 
So I've got, again, a number of helpers to help me out. So we'll start at the far end. Introduce who you are, nice and loud, and where you're from. I'm Suzanne Gamsey from St. Paul the Apostle School in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I'm Betsy Nichols from St. Bartholomew in Columbus, Indiana. Jody Hardenfield from Odyssey Academy in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota. Wonderful. All right. And you're going to help me out this time. What good simple machine are we focusing on today, ladies? The wedge. The wedge. All righty. So a wedge is really what? Do anybody remember from back in elementary school? It's what? Two in inclined planes. Two inclined planes, right? Put together, it's going to be our wedge. So a wedge can be a lot of things out there. And we've got lots of examples. And we're going to explore one in just a minute. But think in your classroom right now while you're out there. What are some examples that you can think of that you may have seen in your house or at school that are wedges? So take a couple minutes in your class and discuss what are some wedges? So hopefully you come up with a couple ideas, share those out there. So we're going to take it to the next level and kind of see how a wedge works. So before we get into that, we're, what we're going to do is explore how a wedge saves us force. All right? And in this case, we're going to experiment with a couple different ideas. We're going to take what we've got here is we've got some clay, modeling clay, and we have some objects that we're going to try to actually cut using, or cut the clay using. So the first object we have is, Suzanne? A pencil. A pencil. So let me know. Try to cut through the, the clay with a pencil. How's it working? Uh, not so well. A lot of force, little force? A lot of force, but not right. much is happening. Great. All right. And give it another shot. And we're going to use a dowel rod this time. How are we doing? It's taking a lot of force. A lot of force to work through. All righty. And in this case, next example with um, Jody, we're going to try the tongue depressor craft stick. Force. A lot of force, all right. Hard. Now, thinking about it from a science perspective, why is it taking a lot of force? We have what? It's spread out over. Okay, we've got a large surface area, right? Trying to cut in through a thick, dense subject, all right? So let's try and get a wedge. One example of a wedge, if I can borrow that for a second, Suzanne, is a knife. So simple example of a wedge is a knife, and let's see if it's saving energy or force for our participants here. How does that compare cutting with the pencil? It works awesome. Works much easier, great. A lot of force saved, right? Yes. Okay? Yes. Compare it to our dowel rod? Uh, quite a bit easier. A lot, quite a bit easier? Much better. Much better. All right, so in your classroom, one of the things I'd like you to do is, why is it that a force, is our wedge is requires less force to move through an object? So in your classroom, discuss that for a few minutes. Alrighty, and so let's take a look to learn a little more. Again, lots of resources within Discover Education Science textbook. We've got a great video on wedges, so let's take a look at that video on wedges for just a minute. Anything that cuts is considered a wedge. Knives, tips of shovels, scissors, can openers. These are all wedges, for they can cut through things. Little video segment talking about the wedge. So we've got, again, some more helpers with us. So if you will introduce yourself. Mary Morrison from St. Lucas Elementary in Rockford, Louisiana. Wonderful. And? Amanda Birch, Canton ISD, Canton, Texas. Well, welcome. Great. So they're going to help us out. And we're going to do um, a simple experiment with a wheel and axle. So first off, what, think, talk in your classroom, what is a wheel and axle? And if you don't really know exactly how to describe a wheel and axle, see if you can come up with some ideas of examples of wheels and axles you may have seen in your classroom or around your community. Also think about how does a wheel and axle for our upper level students save energy or force, or conserve force. So let's take it to the next level. We're going to do a little lab experiment. So Mary, if you'll give me a hand here for a minute. And just stand on that side for me. That would be wonderful. And what we've got here is we've got a simple handmade wheel and axle system. 
where our axle is our dowel here, and then our wheel will be allowed to turn. And we're gonna lift up a pumpkin. So if we can first give me an idea about how it feels lifting up straight up. Heavy. A little heavy, all right. So let's see if we're gonna be able to save some energy by using the wheel and axle. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna attach this pumpkin to our wheel and axle. Make sure I get it on there securely. And if you will turn our wheel and axle or wheel for us. Lighter, easier. Much lighter, much easier. All right. So another way to save the use of energy or force on lifting an object through our wheel and axle. Now, in your classroom, a couple questions for you. How does a wheel and axle conserve or save energy, I'm sorry, force on work? And then for our upper level students, how can a wheel and axle be used in a system? Again, we've got a better great resource. Now this is video, the next uh, resource is kind of geared more toward our middle level students. Let's take a look at a video talking about mechanical advantage saved using, or the mechanical advantage gained using a wheel and axle. The mechanical advantage for a wheel and axle is determined by dividing the diameter of the wheel by the diameter of the axle. Let's calculate the mechanical advantage of this doorknob. The diameter of the wheel part is 5 centimeters. The diameter of the axle is 2 centimeters. Therefore, the mechanical advantage is 2.5. So our next simple machine is a screw. So hopefully we can give a little example of what a screw is. You've seen these around maybe in your dad's workshop, uh, if you're at the garage, somewhere around the house, in the classroom, you've got a screw. But what is a screw really? So a screw is nothing more than an inclined plane taken and wrapped around an axle of some sort, of, of basic axle. So, to give you an example of that, Amanda, if you'll demonstrate for us, let me get a little piece of tape for you. You can hold it in place. And we're going to demonstrate so you can see visually that it really is the case that a screw is an inclined plane around an axle. So if you'll do the pleasure, honors of wrapping that up for me. So now we've got, great, thank you. We have, hopefully you can see the black lines in here, our screw system being demonstrated through the inclined plane around our axle. Now, multiple ways that screws can conserve energy and can, or conserve force. Um, so talk in your class, what are some ways that screws conserve force in the class, uh, in, in your community or in your house? Also talk about what are some ways that deter determine how much force is required to utilize a screw. And what work is energy is being replaced by having the incline plane as part of the screw system. So let's take a look at a great resource dealing with a screw coming again from the Discovery Education Science textbook.
welcome back. Hopefully you enjoyed that little um, tutorial on how to find a great hands-on lab around a screw um, within a science textbook. We've got some more assistants, assistants help up front now with us. So we'll start over here on my right-hand side. Todd Dixon from Palaka, Florida. Uh, Ashley Knowles from Wilburite Middle School in Munster, Indiana. Julie Glavin, Elliott Elementary School, Munster, Indiana. Great. And if you all slide just a little closer yeah. this way, that would be great. So we're going to be focusing in on this, the last of our simple machines, a pulley. So we're going to be asking a couple questions that you can discuss in your class. So how does a pulley change the direction of force to move an object? And does the size and or number of pulleys impact the amount of force required to move an object? So as you're talking about that in the class, we're going to get our little lab set up here. So come on around this way, Todd. Mm -hmm. And Ashley, you want to, there you go. So the first thing we're going to do is we've got an object here with some little candy pumpkins. And we're going to see how many newtons is required, how many, how many newtons are required to lift our object. Let's see, it's about 2.1 newtons. 2.1 newtons, great. So now let's see what happens if we attach this to our pulley system. And let's see how many newtons is required to lift it up using the pulley system. Uh, about 1.9. About 1.9. So we do have some force, less force being needed to move our object. So that's with what we call a stationary pulley. Our pulley is attached to our center area. What if we have what's called a mo movable pulley? So we're going to set up a movi movable pulley system to see how that impacts. So in this case, we're going to check the weight of our object again, the mass of our object, and how many newtons are required to lift our object. So Julie's going to check that out for us. Okay, and again, it is 2.1 newtons. 2.1 newtons. And what we've got set up, we'll get Todd situated here. Thank you, Todd, for your help. So what we've got is we've got a pulley that is movable. It can actually shift up and down this string. A movable pulley, not locked into place. So now we're going to actually test. We have how many, Julie? 2.1 newtons. 2.1 newtons required to move, lift our object. So let's get our object on the table. We'll back up a little bit this time. And let's see, actually, if you want to pull out a little bit and see how we're doing to lift. This is about 1.8. 1.8, so even less newtons required to lift our object with a movable pulley than with a stationary pulley in our example. You might want to test this out in your classroom, see if you get similar results or similar reactions to it. So do you think more pulleys might increase or decrease the, work, uh, the newtons required? And what, if the force necessary to, to decrease a, uh, a lift with more pulleys, what increases at that point in time? So those are the questions you can answer, ask in your class. Again, middle school, elementary school folks, discuss those in your classroom for a few minutes and let's see what kind of replies you get. Feel free to add them into the chat window if you would like. So, in order to, to take a better, better understanding of what happens when you add more pulleys, we've got a great resource called Pulleys at Work, an exploration on resource. So let's take a look at that real quickly. Great resource again from Discovery Education Science Textbook, Pulleys at Work.
So hopefully you've enjoyed so far our exploration and understanding of simple machines, and hopefully you can learn a little more about simple machines. But if you were with us last month, you may be asking this question, so where does the pumpkin chunk in video come into play? If you weren't with us last month, let's show that video for just a second. Adam, it's sure. Thanksgiving. Do you want to do anything? How about some pumpkin chunking? Yeah! I think they're ready. The Chunk is back. It's Pumpkin Chunkin', hosted by the Mythbusters. I'm Adam Savage. And I'm Jamie Heineman. We're in the pits with 110 competitors that showcase everything from human-powered catapults to gigantic air cannons. The team that launches an 8 to 10 pound pumpkin the farthest wins the championship. All righty, welcome back. So again, we got to make that connection for you folks. So we do want to tie in some of the machines and we want to get that pumpkin chunking in. So we got a fun way to do that, I think. So what we're going to do is we're going to show you real quickly, and we've got a video on our website. We'll show the website um, at the end here on how to create your own catapult that you can use in your classroom using nothing more than craft sticks, rubber bands, and some double stick tape and a water bottle cap. So let's take a look at how easy this is to do. The first thing I do, I take two craft sticks and a single rubber band, and I'm going to wrap around one end loosely, around the rubber band around two craft sticks at one end. So it can be open on the other end. It's there, and I have it. And again, we have a video for this that we'll share with you at the end. I'm going to take the other nine craft sticks. A total of 11 craft sticks for this activity. I'm going to take the other nine, I'm going to stack them neatly together, and I'm going to wrap around nice and tight on one end the rubber band, so I've got a nice bundle of nine with a rubber band around one end. Now I'm going to take another rubber band and wrap it around the other end. So I've got my bundle of nine, rubber, nine craft sticks with rubber bands on either end and a nice tight little bundle. And I still have my two craft sticks with a loose rubber band at the other end. I'm then going to take my stack of nine and I'm going to put it between my two craft sticks. So I got a nice little tight fit. I want to slide it down toward the rubber bands as tight as I can go. And I'm going to take my remaining one rubber band. I'm going to start on one end of my nine stack, wrap it over, just so you can see it a little bit, over, twist, and around. I'm going to come back and do the exact same thing again, coming back over, and I'll do that as many times as I need to to get a nice tight fit. When I'm ready, I can actually push it down a little further to get, again, a nice tight fit. We want it down as far as possible. I'm going to bring it up tight so you can see. What we're looking at this point in time. So we've got our nine bundle, we've got our two craft sticks all connected together. We're then going to take some double stick tape and we're going to take one piece of double stick tape. I'll bring it up close so you can see. If I can get the other end off, that'd be great. And I'm going to stick that on one end of my two craft sticks. So I've got my double stick tape, again, my nine bundle and my two bundle. I'm then going to take my water bottle cap, and I'm going to press it firmly onto the double stick tape. So it's nice and secure. On it, to give you, if you're doing this in your classroom with your class later on, be sure to give it a little time to actually settle. We're going to use ours right away, but you want to make sure you have it settled. And before I do the next part of this, always, if you can have your students do this with your classroom, they need to wear the safety goggles. Make sure they have the safety goggles on. So what we've done is we've created a complex lever system. It's still a lever. It's just more complex. It is going to save us force, the amount of energy, or newtons to manipulate an object. We're going to take a candied pumpkin. We'll bring that up here. And we can set it into our catapult. And using our lever system, 
our fulcrum's down at the base here. We can actually pull back our catapult, and I can launch it out to wherever I need to. Again, students, you need to have safety goggles if you're gonna do this in your classroom. Teachers, make sure they have those for safety purposes. So we're gonna give it a countdown of five, four, three, two, one. We have a nice launch out into our crowd, out to the enemy out there. They all come back. So again, we've got a video on how to do that. Um, hopefully your enemy doesn't fire quite as many back at you as mine did. Um, but in a nice little connection in with our Halloween theme this month. This, this month. Um, again, this is a great activity. Last month we did a fun activity that we told you what you could do as an uh, example and a video example. This is the one we encourage you to do with your classroom. Talk to them about a couple key things. Where's the fulcrum? What force is being applied? What energy, or what forces be, or what newtons are being saved? Demonstrate the catapult for your class. Get a full example of what happens. We hope you've enjoyed this month's si seasonal science stream. And it's hope giving you a better understanding of simple machines. Um, before we sign off for the day, we want to leave you with a topic for next month. Next month's topic is going to deal with a lesson on electricity um, and holiday light spectacular, a lesson on electricity. So thank you for attending. Have a great day. And we look forward to seeing you again on the bottom of the last slide that will be shown here in a minute is our blog site. You can find the video to access the catapults and create your own catapults in your classroom. Have a great day and thanks for joining us. Woo!